Hey everyone, I'm Seth Gilbert and I'm very happy to be here with you today virtually for this uh, research week. When the organizers asked me the title of my talk, I didn't yet know what I was going to talk about, so I said TBD. But that turned out to be a very apt choice, uh, since in fact what I would like to talk about today is three back-off dilemmas. Okay, I'm going to explain a little bit later in this talk what I mean by that, uh, but for now let's just think of this as the question of how to cooperate. Okay. What do I mean by that? Well, let, let me take a step back and talk a little bit about distributed algorithms. So once upon a time, uh, way back in the long gone days, you might remember, there were these things called parties where people would get together and they would talk and chit chat uh, and, you know, make conversation. And if you're at a party, someone is inevitably going to ask you, so what do you do? And you have to come up with an answer that will make sense. And one of the first things you learn uh, as a computer scientist, when you go to such a party, uh, as you is that most of the other people there are not computer scientists, and you have to give an answer they're going to understand. So for example, imagine I'm at a cocktail party and Queen Elizabeth walks up and she says, so what do you do? And I answer, ah, I do distributed algorithms. That's not the most useful uh, response. You get, huh? Okay. Well, and so I have to make this understandable. I might say something like, I invent instructions, recipes, for how computers can coordinate to accomplish some goal. She probably knows what a computer is, so this, this probably makes some sense. Uh, you still might get, like what? Well, we were just talking about parties. Imagine a party of robots. Here's our little, here are our little robots throwing a little party. Okay, uh, and great. Uh, imagine that these robots, they all want to use the same power plug, this one over here. We have to decide which of them should get to use the power plug first. This is a classic resource allocation problem. Okay. Or maybe we want to decide on a schedule. We want to come up with an order so every robot gets a turn to recharge. This is a scheduling problem now. Maybe there are time constraints. Every robot only has a certain amount of time before it has to plug into the wall again, before it runs out of power. Okay, we have scheduling problems. Or with our robot party, maybe when the party's over, we'd like the robots to help clean up, uh, and we have to decide which robots should do which jobs. This is a task allocation problem. Okay, so these are all just examples of coordination problems, problems where we have a set of devices that have to cooperate to accomplish something, whether it's resource allocation, scheduling, task allocation, uh, or many more. If I was talking to Queen Elizabeth, by now I'm probably definitely done. Uh, I don't think she's interested in hearing any more than that. Uh, since I'm talking to you all, though, I can say a little bit more. And if I had to answer the question, what are distributed algorithms, I would probably divide them up into three categories. Okay, uh, you know, coordination protocols, data management, and analysis, and network organization. Uh, I'm going to talk about coordination protocols today, uh, but you know, under data management, you might get things like distributed databases, distributed file systems, distributed optimization, MapReduce, cluster computing. Uh, these are, are the types of protocols that are built around moving data around and analyzing it. Okay. On the uh, network organization front, you get problems like routing and minimum spanning trees and graph algorithms and spanners and network partitioning. Uh, these are network related algorithms. Okay. And then what I want to talk about today is coordination protocols. Uh, things like agreement or consensus protocols. If you've been paying attention to Bitcoin and blockchains, you've heard a lot about consensus. Problems like mutual exclusion and resource allocation. Uh, leader election, how do we choose a leader, voting, and so on. Synchronization protocols, we all need to synchronize our time or synchronize on something else. Uh, symmetry breaking protocols, uh, and so on. Coloring protocols, these are all coordination protocols. Okay, so what I want to talk about today is essentially a class of coordination problems. And in particular, I want to talk about contention resolution, which I feel like is at the heart of most coordination protocols. Okay, uh, it's one of these sort of key building blocks you need to solve a whole lot of problems. Uh, so what do I mean by contention resolution? Here is a classic scenario. You have a lot of devices, these processors over here, 
uh, and they all want to use a shared resource here. This is like an Ethernet channel, uh, is an example of a shared resource. But only uh, one processor can use this Ethernet channel at a time. Okay, so we have a lot of contention on the channel and we have to resolve it. We have to uh, choose which of them should get to use the channel at any given time. Okay, there are actually several different goals that we could be focusing on here, right? We could be asking how long till one processor succeeds? How do we get one device to finish as fast as possible? Or we might want all the processes to succeed. Maybe they want to take turns, we want to schedule. Uh, maybe uh, we care most about throughput. What we really want to make sure is that the, the Ethernet channel here is being constantly used. That's a very efficient as long as the channel is constantly in use, we don't care so much. Maybe there are fairness constraints and so on. There are a lot of different ways you can measure the goodness uh, of your contention resolution protocol, but it's a very fundamental problem. Okay? Uh, basically, if you can solve contention resolution, you can solve problems like consensus. Consensus is really about the same as leader election, which is just choosing one device out of your collection of devices. Uh, broadcast, you want to choose one at a time to broadcast something. You know, Wi-Fi medium access, uh, so things like 802.11 uh, is based on exponential backoff. Again, that's a contention resolution protocol. Mutual exclusion, you want to choose one device at a time to enter the critical section. This is exactly a contention resolution problem. Maximal independence set, this is a graph-based problem that's essentially a contention resolution problem, and so on. Uh, the only point I'm trying to make here is that contention resolution is at the core of a whole lot of problems that we really care about. So on the one hand, I'm going to be giving a fairly theoretical talk talking about a fairly abstract problem, contention resolution. At the same time, uh, this is a problem that shows up almost everywhere. Okay. Good. So if you want to solve contention resolution, the history of this problem uh, probably goes back to uh, these papers by Abr Abramson and Metcalf and Boggs back in the 70s, uh, where they introduced this idea of using randomized backoff to solve the problem of contention resolution. Okay. And it's a very simple idea. Uh, basically, you have a bunch of, in this case, let's call them packets that want to access this shared channel. Okay. What do they do? They try to grab the resource. If they succeed, wonderful. They've got, they access the channel, life is good. If they fail, uh, then they randomly choose some time t in a window. Here's a window of size w. They randomly choose a time slot. They wait some period of time and then they broadcast. And if they succeed, then we're happy. In this case, you'll notice both of these packets chose the same, uh, the same value of t, and so they collide again. There's a second collision. Uh, so what do they do? They repeat the process. Again, they choose a random time slot and broadcast. In this case, again, there's a collision. Uh, they try again. This time they get lucky. They choose two different time slots. Life is good. We have solved the contention resolution problem. Both of these two packets have gotten to be broadcast. Okay. So this is randomized back off. It's a very simple paradigm for this. Okay. The key question, if you want to implement this type of protocol, is how should you choose the window size, w, and how should you adapt the window size uh, over time as time passes? Okay. Um, so the classic solution to this is binary exponential backoff. Uh, this is, I would say, the de facto contention resolution uh, algorithm almost everywhere. This is what 802.11 uses. Uh, this is what you find in lots of locking protocols. This is what you find almost everywhere is essentially binary exponential backoff. So here the point is you start with a window of size w equals 2. Uh, and then at every time step, what do you do? You choose a time t in the window, say the second slot here, and you try to broadcast or get the resource at that time slot. If you succeed, life is good. If not, you double the window size and you try again. So now a window of size four. And if you fail, you double the window size and try again. And if you fail, you double the window size and try again. So we had a window of size two, four, eight, uh, and 16 here, and then hopefully by then you find a free slot and you finish and you are done. Okay, so this is binary exponential back off where the key idea is every time we sort of double the amount of time we wait before we try again and use some randomization to make sure that we don't collide with someone else. Okay, good. Okay, so 
I've told you that binary exponential backoff is the de facto solution. It's been around since the 70s, but there are a lot of questions we can ask about binary exponential backoff. Okay? Uh, for example, you might want to know here how many tries is, is this going to take to acquire the resource? Right? Uh, is it going to require one attempt, many attempts? How, how expensive is this protocol in terms of attempts? You might also wonder, hey, we're doubling the window size. Is doubling the right thing to do? Why are we doubling? Maybe we should quadruple, maybe we should square, who knows? Okay. You might ask, what sort of throughput do we get from this? How, how good is this at using our, our resource? Is this an efficient way to use our resource? You might ask questions like, how well does this deal with new arrivals? What if packets are constantly arriving with overlapping windows? Does this still work? You might ask, how robust is this? What if there is some noise going on? What if there's some failures happening? What if there's some jamming? What if there are malicious users? How robust is this protocol? You might ask about deadlines. What if we need the packets to finish in terms of some deadline? Uh, what if you have quality of service guarantees? Your packets are from some video stream and you want to ensure your video stream is sufficiently good. Okay? Some of these questions we know the answer for now, some we don't, and some we now know how to do better. Okay, so this is sort of what I want to talk about today. This is in some ways the outline of things I want to say at least a few words about today. Okay. Um, so as I said at the beginning, binary exponential backoff is essentially the de facto solution today. Uh, it's what 802.11 uses uh, for medium access control on a collision you back off and wait. There's a lot more that goes on in 802.11, obviously, in Wi-Fi than just the backoff protocol, uh, but this is a key part of 802.11. It's also what a lot of locking protocols use, like spin locks uh, in, in parallel computing. Okay, they're gonna use exponential backoff to acquire the lock. If the lock is busy, you back off and spin, and then you try again. And if it's still busy, you back off and spin and try again. And I could put many other applications up here. These are just two of the most familiar applications of binary exponential backoff. Okay, so given that I've just told you that this is an immensely common protocol, I now want to say something very controversial, something almost as controversial as the question of cats or dogs, coffee or tea, John or Paul, P, NP, to be or not to be, all controversial questions. What I want to claim is that exponential back off is broken. Despite the fact that everyone uses it, despite the fact that you find it everywhere, it is not a very good choice to use. And I bet lots of people watching this video perhaps uh, disagree with this statement and think this is a crazy and controversial thing. Uh, so let me try to explain why I think this. Okay, uh, I want to explain a little bit later in this talk why it actually has fairly poor throughput. It scales fairly poorly, it fails on bursty loads, and it's really not very robust. And I'll say a little bit more about this now. Okay, so this is, is my plan for the rest of this talk. I want to tell you why binary exponential backoff is broken. I want to tell you some ideas, some techniques for how you can get better throughput, which is one of the many problems it has. And then I want to talk about some of the other aspects, where we are today, other, this is I'm going to talk about the three backoff dilemmas, other things we can do, recent results, and some open questions. Okay. Uh, and given time constraints, I'm going to have to accelerate as we go through this talk. Uh, but really what I want to get to today is some of the exciting things that I think are left to work on uh, in this area. Okay. Good. So let's take a, a step back. Uh, what I'm talking about, the terminology I'm going to use today, is I'm, we should think about a multiple access channel. Imagine that time is divided into discrete slots. Okay, here we go. Uh, and in every slot, a device can do one of two things. It can either broadcast, say this packet here is doing, or it can listen. It can sense the channel and determine what's going on. And we're going to assume that if you listen, uh, then you learn uh, everything. If every broadcaster and listener learns what's going on in that time slot. So if exactly one device broadcasts, then it succeeds and it knows that it succeeded. If two or more devices broadcast, then there's a failure, uh, a collision. And again, everyone knows that. And if zero devices broadcast, then there's silence. And again, you can, if you're listening, you know that. Okay. So you succeed if and only if there is one broadcast. Here, three is a collision. Here, zero is an empty slot. Got it? Is the basic game we're playing clear? 
Okay, at this point you might complain, wait, 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 that's not how it really works. Uh, I'm, a systems, I'm a systems designer, I've built wireless networks, I know that that's just ridiculous, that's not at all how wireless networks work. Uh, and you would be absolutely correct. Uh, this is a simplified model of the real world. And I would argue, by the way, that the goal of a model is to be as simple as possible while still capturing the key underlying phenomenon. We need a model that's going to capture this problem of contention because we want to solve contention resolution. We're going to ignore uh, many of the other, uh, other important issues, but that are not relevant for the contention resolution problem. Okay. So this is a very a highly stylized model uh, for solving this problem. And for now, at least, let's think about throughput as our goal. Okay. Uh, we have some total number of slots that we want to, uh, that we're going to use in our protocol. And we have some number of successful slots. These are the packets that successfully broadcast. And we just want to maximize our throughput. The number of successful slots divided by the total number of slots. In this case, our throughput is four tenths. Uh, we're using 10 slots and there are four successes. Okay, good. Again, there are many other metrics you might care about, but this is a nice simple one to start with. Okay. Good. So now let's go back to binary exponential backoff. And in particular, let's start again with a very simple case. Let's start with the case where we have a whole batch of packets, n packets, that all start at the same time. They all start right here at the beginning, time zero, and they all run binary exponential backoff. How long do you think it's going to take for them to succeed? What, do you, what sort of throughput do you think we get? Okay. Um, Good. Uh, so in particular, before I answer that, I want to point out that there are a variety of binary exponential backoff is doubling the window size. That's down here, w equals 2w at every step. You can, of course, look at a whole variety of alternatives. We could be uh, only increasing our window size by a constant. Uh, we, oh, sorry, we could have a constant window size that never changes. We could be increasing by an additive amount. We could be growing by a 1 plus 1 over log w factor. We could be growing by a 1 plus 1 over log log w factor, uh, or uh, doubling, or we could be growing even faster, 3 or 4w, or w equals w squared, and so on. So these are all slower backoff protocols, and these are all faster backoff protocols. OK? Good. Uh, so what's the approximate running time, then? Um, well. For a, a fixed size window, it's going to be exponential in n, right? If w is a constant, it's going to take a very long time before anything finishes. Okay. Uh, if, it, if we increase additively, we'll get something like n squared performance. Okay. So we don't really want to do additive increase. And here's where it gets interesting, though. It turns out that binary exponential backoff, it's going to take order n log n time uh, for things to finish. Okay. By contrast, uh, logarithmic growth growing by 1 plus 1 over log w also is going to take about order n log n time. And then it turns out the best you get here is this growing a little bit faster than logarithmic, a little bit slower than binary exponential, 1 plus 1 over log log w. Your n packets will finish in n log log n time. It turns out this is actually roughly the best you can do for a monotonic backoff protocol, one that only increases its window size. I'll come back to that in a sec. OK, let me try to give you a hint for why this is true. Let's, let's think about a simple case where we're just going to always use a window size uh, of size n. OK, so every window is the same size. Uh, and you, each of the n packets in the first window is going to choose one of the first n slots. This is essentially throwing n balls into n bins. And we want to know how many of these slots gets only one packet. It turns out you can show that a constant fraction will succeed. I wrote here n over 2 packets. It's really n over e packets. Uh, it's a constant fraction uh, that will succeed. Okay. So then what happens? Well, then in the next window, also of size n, we finished half the packets. We only have about half the packets left. So now in the first window, your probability of success was a half. Now it turns out your probability of success is going to be 3 quarters. Okay. Uh, and there will only be about n over 8 packets left. And then at the next window, it turns out your, your probability of success is going to square again. And in every window, you're going to actually square your probability of success. And so if you do out the math, which I'm not going to do for you here today, 
uh, you'll discover that within about log log windows, everything finishes. This is just intuition. We're not being very precise here. Uh, but the moral of the story is that after a log log of these windows, uh, everyone is going to finish with high probability. Your throughput is going to be one over log log n. Okay, so this isn't too bad. We're, 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 we're using at least one over log log of our uh, time slots effectively, even though it's not uh, quite right. It's not great. Um, okay, so this is for constant size windows. What about exponential back off? Okay. Well, the thing about exponential back off is it starts with a small window and it doubles and doubles and doubles. And up until it gets to the window of size n and over log n, nothing good happens, right? It basically doesn't do any, nothing gets through up until the window gets big enough. Once the window gets to be about size n, then the process I just talked about starts working. And it turns out that about log log windows later, everything is going to finish. Okay, uh, good. So right, no packet succeeds until about w equals n. Uh, it'll again take about log log windows to finish. These log log windows are going to take two to the log log time. Uh, and so the last window size here is going to be size n log n. And so the total running time to finish our n packets is going to be order n log n. Okay. So this is really not so good, right? Uh, we have only n packets, and yet we need n log n time to finish. We are wasting a huge fraction of our bandwidth. And especially, you'll notice, in this last window of size n log n, there are only a couple packets left to deliver, right? We have this huge window that we're wasting just to deliver the last couple packets that we have left. So this doesn't seem like a very efficient protocol for a, a variety of reasons, okay? Uh, okay, good. But this is the claim. With high probability, all packets will transmit uh, in log log n tries, and the throughput is 1 over log n. So the good thing here, by the way, is it doesn't take very many broadcasts. Only log log n attempts is good enough. Okay? But the throughput is fairly bad. Okay, good. This is just repeating that summary of before. I'm being a little bit more precise here. So for example, log log growth actually gets you order n log log n over log 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 n. I left out that triple log factor last time. Um, uh, but good. And here's a picture in case, you know, it's always fun to run some simulations. It's always good to try to get a visual sense for what's going on. We see that, you know, additive increase of window size is terrible. Exponential back off uh, gets you this sort of, uh, sort of unfortunate curve. Uh, and log and log log back off are much better. Okay. Now you can't actually see the difference between log and log log back off because it turns out the difference between uh, you know log log and you know log n and log log n is hard to see. Um, so it is for you know 35 or 40,000 things. It's hard to see the the gap between the two of them. Okay. Um, good. So exponential back off. Not such a good back off protocol here is sort of the point I want to make. Okay, uh, now you might say doubling. What if I wanted to do four exponential back off? I want to grow by a factor of four, or I want to grow by a factor of r, r exponential back off. This should be w equals r times w. Uh, I increase by a factor of r every time. Uh, that only makes things worse. Backing off faster is actually a problem, right? You back four exponential. Uh, Four, exponent, four exponential back off gives you n log squared n running time. Uh, and it just keeps getting worse as you increase r. So basically, exponential back off is already backing off too fast. And so making it even faster only hurts you. OK? Good. So as I said, it turns out log log back off is actually the optimal monotonic protocol. Or by monotonic, I mean one where you only increase the window size. If you want to only increase the window size, use log log back off. It's pretty good. Uh, and it's basically the best you're going to do. And already you'll be improving over binary, ex binary exponential back off. So if you just switch your existing protocol to back off a little slower, you're going to see better performance. This is a change you can make easily today to your existing code. Okay? Good. Uh, so the moral of the story here is that exponential back off is disappointing in terms of throughput. You're getting like one over log n throughput. In an example experiment with, say, n equals 100, you end up wasting 90% of your channel bandwidth and only using 10% of the available bandwidth. Uh, so this just seems pretty, pretty horrible. 
uh, log log back off is just better. Uh, but even so, it doesn't achieve constant throughput. We, I mean, even even log log back off is still you know far from optimal. I think we we can still do better than that. Okay. So this is all about batches. What about dynamic arrivals? What about uh, if you have lots of pack, packets are arriving over time in different ways at different times. Okay. Uh, and there's been a ton of work on, on back off with packets that arrive over time. People look at all sorts of different models, queuing theory models, adversarial queuing theory, station-based models, and so on. I don't have the time to get into all this uh, different work today. But the point I want to make today is that exponential back off also doesn't work well in these dynamic arrival models. Okay? So in particular, one very common case that we might worry about uh, are these are, are networks with bursty arrivals. So for example, imagine that you have usually sort of a slow trickle of arrivals and then every so often a big burst of data arrives, you know, a whole big chunk of data arrives and then we go back to this very slow uh, trickle of data. Okay, this is sort of a bursty environment and actually exponential back off is particularly bad in this type of scenario, okay? Uh, I don't want to get into the, the math here. I was trying to give some intuition, uh, but roughly what's happening here is that, you know, contention stays low here. When there's this big burst, you suddenly have very high contention. And then this continuing slow trickle is enough to prevent this, uh, this slow arrival trickle is enough to keep this big contention from decreasing too much. It'll decrease a little bit, but then it sort of stabilizes around here until the next burst comes along and knocks it up again. And so you always have uh, reasonably high contention, which means that you'll always get very low throughput. Okay, so exponential back off is actually very bad in bursty situations. Okay, good. Uh, so hopefully this gets across some of the intuition for why exponential back off gets you know, poor throughput. It uses the channel, use it, it's very inefficient in channel usage. It fails on bursty loads. I didn't talk about robustness, but it's terrible for robustness as well because anytime you have some noise or an attack on the system, everyone doubles their window size. So a very small attack causes everyone to spend a lot more time processing. So it's actually very fragile in terms of it responds very badly to uh, noise or attacks on the system. Okay. okay. Um, so I don't have a lot of time left. I only have 10 or 15 minutes left. But what I want to explain in the rest of this talk is first some intuition for how we can get some better throughput, and then I want to get on to sort of recent results and where we are today. Okay, so how can we get constant throughput? There are sort of two issues. One is batch arrivals, and then we want to extend that to dynamic arrivals. Okay, um, well the first thing with the batch arrivals, let's imagine that we have n packets all arriving at once, okay, and we want to choose the, we imagine you know n in advance. Someone magically says here, there are gonna be n packets that arrive. What should you do? Well, the right thing in some sense is to choose a window of about size n. If you choose a window of size n, then about n over e of the packets succeed. Well, that's great because now we can decrease the window w for the next window, we can decrease the window by a constant fraction. Right? So this is not, we don't want to keep the window the same size all the time. We know that's not going to work. We want to start out with a window of size n. Then we can decrease it by a constant fraction, something like n over e, n over e squared. These, these constants aren't right. I, don't, I mean n to the 1 minus 1 over e, but it doesn't matter. Uh, you can decrease the window by a constant, a constant fraction, constant fraction, constant fraction. Okay. Uh, and we'll, what, if you add up all of these n plus n over e plus n over, n over e squared and so on, it'll just, everything will finish within order n time. Okay, good. So it turns out that a sequence that looks like this, that's called sawtooth, turns out to be exactly what you want here. Okay, you start out with a window of size one, then you do a window size two and then one, then four and two and one, then eight, then four, then two, then one, then 16, then eight, then four, then two, then one. And if you draw this out like this, you'll see this looks kind of like a sawtooth pattern, hence the name of this pattern. Okay, uh, and so why does this work? Uh, well, let's imagine that you have n equals 64. So your sawtooth builds and builds and builds until you get to the size where the window is size 64. Okay, as soon as the window gets to be size 64, you're gonna start making progress. Uh, and in that first window of size 64, you're gonna finish a constant fraction of the jobs. 
uh, maybe you'll reduce, you get rid of half the jobs. Then you go down to a window of size 32 where we can finish again half the jobs. Again, we finish half the jobs, finish half the jobs, and so on uh, until all the requests finish. Okay, uh, and if you add up all these windows, you'll see that this all finishes in linear time, in order n time. Okay, good. So this is just intuition. You have to be a little bit more careful in the analysis, uh, but it all works out properly. Okay, uh, and so the claim here is for n requests within order n time with high probability everything finishes and we get order one throughput. And you can tune these constants a little bit to control the uh, throughput that you get here. Okay. Good. So this, this is the batch case. What you're seeing is you want to do some combination of backing on and backing off. We want to overall be increasing our window size, but we want to keep decreasing our window size so that we're not backing off too fast. It's very important to decrease your window size as you're having successes. Okay. But you'll notice I want to talk next about the dynam dynamic case where things are arriving over time. That's going to cause all sorts of trouble here because as you are decreasing your window size, if new packets are arriving, they're going to cause trouble. They're going to disrupt the, the pattern. Okay. So the key idea for dynamic arrivals is we want to do some sort of synchronization. We want to do something to prevent the newly arrived packets from disrupting the existing ones. Okay. Essentially, we want to group our requests into synchronized batches where we have some period of time here where the first batch is going to run by itself, then some period of time where the second batch runs, and then the period of time where the third batch runs, and so on. Any packets that arrive during the first batch are going to basically stay silent and wait until it's done before the second batch starts. Okay? And there are ways to do this. I, again, I don't have time to go into details. One way you can think about this is simulating two different channels, a control channel and a data channel, maybe using the odd and the even slots. Uh, and the data channel, you're just going to run sawtooth on your batch. And during the control channel, you're going to basically coordinate so that everyone starts at the same time. Okay, so that basically a packet that arrives uh, while a batch is active is going to see a busy signal on the control channel. Busy, 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 busy. When the, when the batch is done, uh, there will be an empty slot, a free slot. Uh, when you see that slot, you know on the control channel, you know the batch is done, and everyone in the waiting room then can immediately start the next batch. Okay, so we've coordinated things into batches using a control channel and data channel mechanism. And there are whole, again, there are a whole bunch of, of different ways you could implement this. Okay, so let me call that the synchronized sawtooth protocol. Okay, uh, so wait until the first silent round on the control channel. In the next round, run sawtooth back off on the data channel. At the same time, broadcast on the control channel in order to block it and make sure that everyone knows there's a batch going on. Okay, great. This is this this. It turns out that this essentially works and gives you a constant throughput backoff protocol. So this is a little bit more involved than the regular exponential backoff, uh, but it gets you constant throughput. Okay, and you can do this on one channel using even and odd rounds. Okay. One problem to note that I'll say a little bit more later is this involves a lot of effort, a lot of broadcasts, a lot of wasted work, a lot of wasted energy. Uh, I'll say something about that in a little bit. Okay, but as it is, this guarantees that if you have n requests that arrive over time, uh, synchronized sawtooth achieves order one throughput. We're going to use at least a constant fraction of our channel bandwidth efficiently. Okay. Good. So now I've said a little bit, a few words about uh, constant, about uh, getting constant throughput. Now I want to talk a little bit, bit about other things you might want. Okay. I started this talk saying that there were three back off dilemmas that motivated uh, us to work on this problem. Okay. One of them, what I've been talking about so far, is constant throughput. We have requests arriving online. We, have, we don't have batch arrivals. There's no limitation on arrival rate. We don't want to assume that everything's going to eventually stop. The data's going to keep arriving forever. Uh, and we want to get constant throughput. We want to use a constant fraction of our slots. We want to waste at most a constant fraction of our resource. Okay. This is the first goal. And we've just seen, by the way, a protocol that accomplishes that. That's what I was just talking about. Okay? But we want more than that. If that's all we wanted, then we would be done. But we also want to minimize the effort, the number of attempts you have to use on the channel. In, using, trying to access the resource may, resource may be expensive. In a wireless network, this might be energy. Excuse me. In a transactional memory, this might be processor cycles. Uh, in other contexts, there are other reasons why you want to minimize the number of attempts you make. So we, our goal here is to minimize uh, the number of attempts. 
Okay. And so for exponential backlog, things are actually pretty good. You only make order log n attempts per request. That's actually okay. For the protocol I just described, the sort of synchronized sawtooth protocol, it's actually fairly bad, right? Exponential backoff is order log n attempts per process. The synchronized sawtooth protocol is order n attempts per process. So it's actually much worse. This is why it's a dilemma. It seems like there's a trade-off here between these things, okay? Uh, so in particular, the problem is this waiting room is way too expensive that everyone has to broadcast all the time uh, on this channel. Okay. It turns out that if all you care about is minimizing effort, you can actually do a lot better. Uh, there, is a there is a protocol by Bender, Kapilowitz, Petty, and Young uh, that actually only uses log of log star n uh, listening rounds per process and order one broadcast per process in expectation. Uh, so this, this is kind of amazing. You don't often see log of log star n. In theory, that's almost never the bound you will see. Uh, so this is sort of an amazing, uh, an amazing result that you can really, really reduce the number of attempts. Okay? And the key idea here actually was what, was what I'd like to emphasize. What's turned out to be a very useful idea is that instead of using the back off protocol to estimate the size of n, instead of just running back off with this guess and double strategy, you can actually run a separate sub protocol to estimate n, or in this case, to estimate log n. Okay? And it turns out that if you run a separate sub protocol to estimate log n, you can do that very, very efficiently. And then you can run sawtooth protocol starting from n, skipping all of that nonsense in the beginning uh, where you had to wait until the window grew large. And with some extra cleverness, this you can really reduce the number of attempts that you need. Okay? Uh, so this is just one, cle one clever idea of separating the back off protocol into two parts, a contention estimation phase and the actual trying to broadcast phase. Okay, good. Uh, I'm not going to say any more about that right now, though. Um, the third, what's the third dilemma? So, so far, we know how to efficiently get order one throughput. We know how to get very efficient, sort of minimizing the number of attempts. Uh, there's a third, th a third thing we might have to trade off, though, which is the robustness. How do we deal with failures or disruption? A lot of what I worry about in the context of distributed algorithms is how do we deal with, with failures? How do we deal with malicious attacks? Uh, how do we deal with unreliable systems? Okay. Uh, and, well, in a wireless network, what might happen? There might be some noise that means that even in a good round where one person broadcasts, it still fails. Okay. Or in a network, this might be caused by congestion or router errors. Uh, in a lock acquisition case, there could be a synchronization failure. In transactional memory, there could be a, a hardware. You know, best effort hardware means you don't always succeed. In a lot of cases where you use back off protocols, there are examples where even in the good, even if you do the right thing, your attempt is going to fail to acquire the resource. Can we still get an efficient protocol despite this? Okay. So how do we model this? One way we can think about this is that we have an adversary that can just block some of the slots arbitrarily. Okay? Uh, and in the block slots, every attempt fails no matter what you do. Okay? So uh, everyone can see that that happened. Everyone sees the channel is full, but every attempt is going to fail in that. This is, again, these are sort of the no noisy rounds or failed rounds or so on. Okay? So what's our goal? Our goal is to waste at most a constant fraction of the useful slots, okay? Uh, so we basically want to make sure that we get, uh, we successfully use a, uh, a, we still get sort of constant throughput just, uh, at, sort of as best we can, okay? Good. Um, so, uh, so for example, we have uh, sort of, these are some wasted slots. Where this, this slot, we had a collision is a wasted slot. This empty slot is a wasted slot. Uh, the slots where the adversary jams, it's not wasted. We couldn't do anything about it. Uh, and these with successful broadcasts are not wasted. We want to make sure that we waste only a constant fraction of the slots. Okay. So if the jamming is reasonably low, then we'll, we're going to do pretty well. Obviously, if, the advers if there's noise that blocks out all of our slots, then there's nothing we can do. We're doing the best we can in some sense. Okay. Good. So let's, so, so our goal then was to try to come up with a protocol that would do all three of these things simultaneously, good throughput, uh, minimal number of attempts, and to get you good, and tolerate uh, disruption. And so that was this, what we call the re-backoff protocol, a, a very simple modification, it turns out, to exponential backoff that gets you these better properties. 
Uh, so the basic algorithm is going to essentially be synchronized sawtooth. So that, that's where we're going to start. Synchronized sawtooth, though, uses too many broadcasts. So our solution, of course, is to only broadcast probabilistically on the control channel. Okay? So instead of broadcasting all the time, we only broadcast on the control channel with probability log w over w. Okay, this is still going to cause trouble, though, because every so often, just by random chance, there'll be no control message, there'll be no busy signal, so we're going to have overlapping batches. And so we need to make sure that if something bad happens, we're going to reset if there's too little contention. Okay. So this ends up being the whole protocol. I can fit it all on one slide. It's a very simple algorithm in the end. Uh, basically, for a packet U, if you've been active for T slots, then you broadcast with probability 1 over T on the data channel, in a data, on an odd slot, say. Okay. And with probability log T over T, you broadcast on the control channel, the even slots, say. Okay. Uh, and last thing, you monitor the data channel, and if at least 7 eighths T of the data slots are empty, you become inactive. So if things have gotten too sparse, you become inactive and you're going to start again. And of course, when you're inactive, you monitor each control slot. And if the next slot is empty, you become active, or if a slot is empty, you become active in the next slot. So this is basically looking at the control channel and seeing when the next batch should begin. So this is the entire protocol in one slide. Uh, and we were very excited by this because this actually solves the three back off dilemmas. Okay, it's going to, it's just like exponential back off. It uses a cheap busy signal, so not too many attempts. It has this low contention reset, okay, to make sure that we don't waste too much time. Uh, and we have this sort of batch synchronization to make sure we get constant throughput. Okay, um, good, this was just some slides on what's going on. Uh, but the key results here are that uh, we'll get at most a constant fraction of the slots wasted, or really if we have n packets and f disrupted slots, all the n packets will finish in time order n plus f. Okay, this is our notion of constant throughput. Okay. And the number of broadcast attempts will be something like log squared of n plus f. Okay, good. Anything else? Well, at this point I'm running out of time. I was asked to finish in 40 minutes and it's been 40 minutes. Uh, there's a whole bunch of, of recent and exciting work. Uh, one paper I, I would point out to you is this, we've talked about one approach with sort of a back off, back on protocol. Uh, a year later after our paper, uh, Chang, Jin, and Petty uh, sort of simplified this all and said, actually, we can, there's just a simple multiplicative update rule that we can use instead. Uh, and they maintain some probability PI, which they increase by this e to the epsilon and decrease by this e to the epsilon uh, factor on hearing, no hearing silence and hearing noise. And this leads to some very similar performance to this, uh, saw this synchronized sawtooth three back off thing I just talked about, okay? at least in some situations. Another thing I'll talk about, we've so far been assuming you can detect when there's a collision, when two or more broadcast. If you can't detect a collision, what can you do? There was some recent work by Bender, Kepelowitz, Kuzmal, and Petty showing that actually in that case, using a variant of rebackoff, something a bit like rebackoff that I just talked about, you can get constant throughput with no collision detection. Okay. Uh, what about you have deadlines? This was some work that we published just this year. Uh, each packet might have to be delivered by some given deadline. This might be for some quality of service guarantee, or maybe you have a prioritized data stream. Again, you're streaming a movie and you want to make sure the packets are delivered fast enough that your streaming video isn't disrupted. Uh, and in this, this was a case we showed that this separation of the estimation and the broadcast probabilities uh, turns out to work really well. And again, we can do pretty well in this case. Okay? There are a whole lot of other interesting questions that I think remain to, to work on. If you're interested in these type of questions, come talk to me. Uh, can we reduce the energy usage some more? Can we minimize the number of listening and transmission slots uh, even more beyond what we have already done? Okay, right now, it tends to require a fair bit of listening. Uh, how do we deal with jobs of very different sizes? So far, we tend to be assuming packets of all the same size. Uh, in practice, we have some very big jobs and very small jobs uh, that may change things. It's actually have some, some older work from long ago on this, but there's more to be done. Uh, how do we deal with selfish users? So far, we're assuming that everyone is following the protocol, except for the jammer who's just jamming, jam jamming sloth, nothing we can do. What about selfish users? Can we do anything in that case? Okay. Can we use coding theory to allow more than one device to succeed at a time? Right? If, if, if multiple devices can broadcast at the same time, maybe we can do better. Okay. And, and sort of the big question is, is how much do these insights help with real systems? 
right? I told you at the beginning that a lot of systems use binary exponential back off, which isn't all that good. In some cases, that's not the dominant factor. In some cases, there are other parts of the protocol that matter that are currently the bottleneck. And so binary exponential back off isn't yet the problem. But I think there are a variety of contexts where by switching out from binary exponential back off to a better protocol, we should see better performance. Uh, maybe in terms of AO211, certainly in terms of resource allocation, uh, probably in terms of congestion control protocols and more. Okay, so are we done? Just about. Uh, so the, the, so the big picture moral of the story is that exponential back off is used everywhere, but it's fairly disappointing. It gets you fairly poor uh, throughput and has a variety of other problems. It's not robust and so on. Uh, sawtooth back off gets you constant throughput. Okay. Uh, and if you then push a little farther, uh, you can get to this ray back off protocol that we have, uh, which then can make it more robust. Okay. And there are lots of exciting open questions to work on. Uh, and that was actually where I wanted to end today. I wanted to end with a list of exciting things to work on. So I think there's a bunch of things left to do here. So thank you very much for coming to my talk today. Uh, and hopefully I will see you around in person. Thank you.